Okay. Hi, everybody. Today is uh, going to be a really nice day. You're going to learn about cloudy skies. I'm going to teach you the anatomy of cloudy skies. My name is Johannes Floraus, and I'm broadcasting from Canada, and I've been a art instructor for Artist Network for over 25, 30 years. Uh, no, sorry. Prof professional artist for 25 years, from 25 to 30 years, and, and I've been teaching for Artist Network for over 10 years. So I'm very proud of that because those are very good credentials. It's a, you know, this company publishes magazines and they formally publish the North Light books that you can find their magazines and bookstores. So it's an honor for me to be uh, your instructor for today and to teach you what I know about cloudy skies. We're gonna have two demonstrations today. We're gonna have a, a cloudy sky in oils and also in watercolor. So we're gonna pack them together. And for that reason, you can see I already started out. I put the ground on there so we could just dedicate to the sky so I could fit the second painting in. I just want to introduce uh, Jude uh, that's going to be um, narrating your questions or comments to me. So anything that you want to say to me as far as a question or a comment, please type it in capital letters so she can scan through your text very quickly and pick up on it because she wants to watch the video as well. And we also have Cindy, whose name is Pearl Stark. And uh, she will be posting some definitions of some of the art, artist lingo that we use. So we have a whole team here for you. Okay, so I'm going to roll up my sleeves and get going. Uh, I'm going to put my camera on the palette here. Okay, just a minute. I got to put this over here. There we go. I'm gonna just, let me just rotate this. Okay, this time I didn't, a lot of you are used to seeing um, the initials of the pigments, but I can't do that today because I have watercolor too and it's gonna to be too confusing. So, you know, when you sign up for our regular classes, we'll go through all the colors. This is just like a, you know, we got maybe 90 minutes, two hours to do this. Okay, so let's get started. I put myself a little reminder here. Um, there's a certain principle to clouds. I will tell you that as I keep as I go. I like to show you um, how I got the, got to this conclusion. I did what is called a a thumbnail sketch. I think a lot of you have heard about that before. Uh, this used to be in the old days before computers, before we had Photoshop. We had to work all this out in a sketch. So. What it's, what it's about is to distribute the masses. My next course that's coming up this Saturday, day after tomorrow, is, all, is gonna be about that. So I'm not gonna go into details. I just wanted to show you that I've mapped out basically the, the darks, the mid values, the mid light value, and then the white. So the ground is my mid light. That's a mass, okay? We'll also learn about that in the next, in the day after tomorrow. Uh, the foliage and, and, and the mountain is the mid dark. And uh, the shadows of the clouds will be a mid value. And we have the fluffy part of the sky, which is the whites. Uh, this is just so you can work out all the problematic areas before you just dive into the painting. Oh, hello, Irma. Eres de Mexico. Yo viví en la Ciudad de Mexico 20 años. Bienvenida. Oh, by the way, I speak Spanish. If anybody wants to type in Spanish, I'll go ahead and answer it. <laughs> We're bilingual here. Okay, so... Um, yeah, in this case, it's a four-value plan. And uh, the, the trick is, and you're going to learn this more day after tomorrow, is I, I tend to uh, shy away from, from absolute darks as much as possible. But we'll get into that. Okay, so let's get started here. You can see the photograph is on the side. That's my reference photo. I changed a few things. I added some, a little bit of life there with the buildings and some hay bales. Okay, so let's go. Oh, we got to take care of this here. All right, this is this is a step-by-step. -step. Oh, by the way, you're going to get the notes on this. Everything I say that is teaching, we have Cindy's going to be taking screenshots, and she will. Uh, we will share that with you when you register for the next course that starts day after tomorrow. You can download a PDF like a booklet. Okay, so here we go. Here goes our first part of our notes. Are you ready there, Cindy? All right. So let me erase this.
Oh, I did my underpainting with a pastel pencil. Okay, so I'm going to use a mixture with uh, just a little bit of yellow ochre pale. And the way it works is, if you want to take some notes in the meantime, the principle, the anatomy of cloudy skies works like this. This is the zenith, and that's the horizon. The fluffy part of the clouds, the white part of the clouds, in other words, the part that doesn't have the moisture, is cooler at the top, warmer towards the bottom. So you add more white and less yellow. In other words, you just tint the yellow barely here. Sorry, you just tint the white barely here um, just to get an off-white because the, the white itself is a very cool color and it's very unpleasant for viewers to see that. So artists uh, tend to uh, add a little bit of warmth to the, to the whites. I'm using a big brush. There's no reason to use a small brush. And uh, I've given a lot of personal workshops as well. And I've noticed that a lot of artists, novice artists, they tend to do this. So one good thing about these online classes is that you will learn to imitate my brush strokes. So you don't want to do this. You want to have assertive, big, broad brush strokes. I equate this as putting um, band-aids, like, like putting a band-aid on a person's hand. Big, juicy brush strokes. Now you can see that in the photograph, this is uh, somewhat designed in a way that we create a visual path, a linear path that starts from the top left and gradually moves in a zigzag format back and forth like a pendulum from the left to the right until it eventually reaches the middle ground or the background. Now, why would that be important? Can anybody answer that? You can barely see the off-white here. I got a strange way of doing this. A lot of people would think, well, why don't you put the blue in first? No, not me. I, uh, I tend to do it this way because I'm going to cut out the fluffy card, fluffy cards, <laughs> fluffy clouds um, by negative painting. Okay, the answer is when you open a book or a newspaper, or whatever, how do you, where do you start reading it? You start reading it from left to right, correct? Okay, so viewers will feel comfortable if you create a visual path, even from the sky, because we're, we're used to thinking in, in terms of a visual path initiating um, from, the, um, from the bottom, right? That's, that's the standard, but not necessarily. You can organize your cloud structures to do the read, like just like you read a book. You read a book from left to right, sentence by sentence. So what I'm doing is I'm appealing to your subconscious mind that you will read the painting and you will feel comfortable as your eye travels through the forms of the clouds just like you're reading a sentence. Pretty tricky, huh? Okay, so I'm going to get warmer over here. And the reason I'm putting that much yellow here is because we have quite a bit of it over here, so we want it to harmonize. A little bit yellow, yellow green on your screen so I'm just gonna adjust that a bit there we go that does it Joel are you able to turn your volume up just a touch sure um, touch. I don't see you know what I'll just bring the microphone closer to me Make sure that I don't drown you out Wait, I know how to do this. Okay, how does that work? We have to make sure that uh, Jude is also loud. Okay, hold on. Just got to get that. There's a cast shadow now from the microphone. I got like a Larry King microphone here on my desk. The only difference is that mine is full of paint. <laughs> Everything in my studio is full of paint. 
as we all would expect it to be. Yeah, I keep saying, uh, you know, if you go to a lawyer and you look at his desk and it's all clean, it looks like he doesn't have cases, which means he doesn't have enough experience. You want to go to a lawyer's office where it's all full of papers. That means he, he's, uh, he's good at what he does. I'm putting the paint on rather thinly because I want to um, go on top of that with the, with the darker colors. Normally, Susan I would must. Susan is asking, do you normally paint the sky first? No. When it comes to oils and pastels, Susan, what I, what I do is I think in terms of, of a puzzle. And the idea is to snap the puzzle pieces together one way or another. So you think in little, little abstract shapes, right, that you snap together. So it really doesn't matter where you start. Many times I start, I put the sky in later because I can, when I have trees and mountains, I can go in and carve in, which is negative painting, and I can correct some of the, the, the trees that would be too round at the top. So I, I, that for me, that's preferable. When it comes to watercolor, of course, you don't have an option. You have to put the sky in first. There's no two ways about that. Okay, another important thing about skies is take an imaginary line down the middle, compare both sides, make sure that one side of your sky is dramatically different than the other. That makes it more entertaining. Okay. Now I could probably go, for, let's go make it a little bit later in the afternoon. Let's put a little tad of orange here, right at the very bottom just so we can stay by our principles that the fluffy white part of your clouds are cooler. In other words, more white, less yellows at the zenith. In other words, where the rocket goes up into outer space, where Jeff Bezos went up to outer space. I don't think he went all the way to outer space, though. Not that far. And it gets warmer as you go towards the horizon. And obviously... Late, the later the afternoon, this will be this tinge of warm color here will be more emphasized. So right now I'm indicating it's not close to sunset, but not far away either from a sunset. Okay, so warmer, no cooler, warmer. Okay, next principle: the blue part of the sky. So I'm going to use Prussian blue, and the reason why I like Pr Prussian blue so much. As my, I never paint a blue sky and I never paint blue water. Now hold on, you're gonna say, what? How is that possible? I'll make it, I'll clarify. I'm talking about blue as a primary color on the color wheel. I don't use that because there's no way to harmonize it. So if I use Prussian blue, Prussian blue is a turquoise blue, it's got a little bit of green in it. And so it's going to harmonize. The fact that it's got a little bit of green means it, got, it has a little bit of yellow. And it's going to harmonize with the, with the ground. Whether it's an ochre ground or it's a, a green, green grass. Now if you want your clouds to stand out, go pretty dark on the blue part of the sky. That way they pop nicely. Okay, now here's another neat tidbit here. Two different corners. So this is going to be a blue corner, and that's going to be a cloud in the corner. So I don't, one, one formula to boredom is to repeat corners. That's why I put the blue here at the bottom. I also do this technique for watercolor, by the way, which you'll see shortly. See, I like, the, I, I like this negative painting. Now, why is negative painting so important? And I don't feel that enough artists exploit that enough. Because we have, in our subconscious mind, we have memories of, muscle memory, of drawings that we used to do when we were kids. So we would create a round sun, stick figure people, triangular Christmas trees. And so, if... It, you can't fight against it. It's, it's going to always be with you. But there's one way you can overcome it is to do something that you didn't do as a child. You never negative painted. So when you do that, then you have no stored preconceived ideas of how that is done. 
the advantage of that is you're going to create much more interesting shapes. I'm going to put some random strokes in there. I'm holding my brush all the way to the top like this. just shoving it in there see though see when I get these this negative painting there these are very random forms I can't produce those from the working from the positive shape okay so now could you turn up your mic a little your sound a touch more your sound no your sound I can't go any louder than that maybe somebody's using a phone or something what about the rest of you can you hear well um, I hear you fine. It's others are complaining about the sound. Well, I could just bring it closer to me. Strange. Uh, Shirley is asking, won't the blue and yellow mix and make green? If you get a little bit about of that, that's fine because you're going to harmonize with the green on the field anyway. But there's very little in there to worry about that. But I'm not going to, even if it happens, that's fine. Okay, now this is the next principle. Skies are cooler. The blue part of the sky is cooler at the zenith and gradually gets warmer towards the horizon. So you start, let's say, from a turquoise blue. And then gradually you go down and you add a little bit of viridian, some green. And if it's later in the afternoon, you go to the yellow. But I'm going to add some green here. And that creates what the famous uh, gradient plane that I talk about so much, which is the answer to many problems. Now, the reason I stuck some of this in here is I want the pigment to hit it and give us some subtle clouds in there. So now we're getting like some background clouds. Okay, I'm going to rinse my brush, and now we're going to start to go into the viridian, which is very good uh, for skies summer sky especially. In fact, you can do a whole entire sky with just viridian. Looks really cool. Well, I should say really, really good, not cool because it's a warm season. So viridian is like a, like a blue-green. Raise the volume even more for, for you, Judy. No, it's good for me. And uh, Wilma's saying she can now hear it better. Thank you. Don't over massage the paint either because you want some of this like, like these strokes showing through those are like clouds that are just barely starting to form in fact you you want to emphasize that a little bit more and do things like this just tap it with some paint here and there what i don't like is to have i got a little portion here but if let's say if i had a bigger sky what i don't like is blue and solid blue and then solid um clouds they look like uh, sheep floating on in a swimming pool so you want to put like little hints of clouds that are starting to form that maybe within half an hour they'll grow into a more mature cloud that would be more of a bigger blue sky let's see there there you got something happening there are you adding liquid to your quick dry white? Uh, yeah i added a little bit and that's the amber colored liquid on your palette. The, this, this is liquid, correct. That's that's just to push the paint around easier because I use the uh, an alkyd paint which dries pretty quickly. Okay, now the shadow part of the clouds works like this. I'm going to use lamp black and ultramarine blue. Okay, your shadow part of the clouds are warmer at the horizon. Sorry, warmer at the zenith. 
cooler towards the horizon. So the reverse is true of the fluffy part. Okay, remember, well, the way to do the brush stroke is pretend you're putting a Band-Aid on. See, big strokes like this. Now watch the, watch the brush movement. I'm going to hold it further up so you can see it better. This is the trick. And I'm varying the pressure. If I vary the pressure, I get a lighter value. Then I push down to get a darker value. And you pull up. The trick is to hardly separate your brush from the canvas. They are loving your sheep floating in a swimming pool. <laughs> you don't forget that, right? Yeah, that is a hard image to get out of your brain once it's there. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> uh, like I said, my son is a, uh, he graduated in advertising. And um, I asked him, how can I make my students remember there's so many details that we have to learn. He says, tell them stupid things, like dumb things, like they do on commercials on TV. They're sort of, they're not very coherent. And that way they'll remember it. So I, I now I've done that and I've implemented that. People say that when they're painting, they say, I, re, I keep listening to that, that absurd analogy that you used in such and such time. See, look, I'm, I'm not, I'm dancing. I'm not even jumping off the floor, right? That's, and now you can practice this. This is any level. I'm gonna add yes, guys, this is always available and replayable on YouTube. It's on Artist Network's site, their YouTube site. Well, it's, uh, this is uh, YouTube directly, but, you know, YouTube never takes down. Well, I can't say never. There have been cases that they've taken it down, but they won't take this down. Um, it's, it's, so it's, it, it, it's not like, you know what I mean? It's not like you have to worry about the recording. It just stays on YouTube. Joe, your photo, is it a Frankenstein photo? Yes. <laughs> Okay, that's going to require explanation, Jude. Spill the beans. Otherwise, we're going to we're going to freak some people out here. Oh, I love the Frankenstein. It's another saying of yours we can't forget. That means that Joe took the a picture um, a photo of the sky from one photo. He probably took the mid mass from another and the foreground from a third, I imagine he might have three or four photos in this one photo he put together on Photoshop Elements. Okay, now I'm gonna, this is what, we're gonna divide into three parts our sky. Part one, part two, part three. We can say background, middle ground, and foreground if you want. Um, uh, this is, it's, I'm going to warm this up. I'm going to add some yellow ochre into, into the cloudy, into the dark part. That's it. Or maybe it'll be a little bit of red. Now we're going to go cooler, which means we're going to go more into the blue here. Your dark part of the clouds, was that lamp black and Prussian blue? Yeah, you can use those too. And again, if you look at his shadow part of the upper clouds, an abstract shape, not many parallel lines or worms that you, you used to call them. Now here's a, here's a, a, a wonderful uh, thing I've learned over the years. And the interesting thing is it's not, I haven't seen it written in the book. 
I haven't seen it mentioned anywhere else. And it's my what I call the famous melodic line. If you note, I'm creating a staircase effect here at the bottom of the clouds to give it um, a nice rhythm, a nice visual movement. We will, um, as you take my classes, you will um, be introduced to that, and you're never going to forget it. It is the answer to so many problems, melodic lines, graceful lines, etc. So here I'm, instead of like copying the forms, I'm feeling the forms. There's a point in your life where you start to feel the, the, what you need to do in, is in brush strokes. That's, that's a good spot to be in. You want to feel the, the forms, feel the lines, not see them. And then you imitate those with your brush. Okay, now we're going to get into what I, we can call the foreground. And um, now we're going to get cooler. So this is practically just pure blue. Now, of course, I got to simplify, right? Because, okay, this is very important. When you take a picture, before it used to be six, uh, what, five by seven inches or six by four inches. Now you can fill up a 27 inch monitor. But still, when you um, look up at the sky, it's, it's, the magnitude is enormous, right? And when you condense that, they scale it down to a six by four photograph or even a computer screen, you're gonna, if you look at the photograph, you're gonna get a lot of little itty bitty areas. Okay, remember this is all condensed. So you can see lots of little fluffy parts like pillow clouds, like when someone's smoking and breathing out. And, uh, but you wouldn't see those in the real scene because they would be huge. So I have to, my sky has to represent the way you would see nature, not the way it looks in the photograph, even if it's the same scale as, as your video or as your photograph. Now, another thing is your sky, your uh, cloud values usually are not darker than the blue and they're not darker than a mid value. So the blue sky and the shadows where, the, where it's about the rain is about the same value. That's as far as the way it works in the value scale. However, when you look at it, you personally feel psychologically that the sky is dark. It's a psychological reaction. It's not an actual value reaction. Um, some artists, they try to create more drama in the sky to make it look like there's a storm by darkening it on purpose, even though it doesn't agree with the real scene. If you remember the movie Twister from Helen Hunt, that's what they did. Uh, they purposely darkened the sky because otherwise it would not have created the effect to make it look very menacing. In this case, I don't want to create that drama, but let's say you want to paint a uh, tornado which I've always wanted to do, and someone beat me to it. Well, it was a drawing, but <laughs> I, want, I want to paint it one day. I don't know if it's going to be very popular to advertise that as a course. Like, um, I've learned that people like to identify with subjects that are pleasant, but I've always, as an artist, you want to get, put, give challenge to yourself, right? You want to paint a hurricane or a tornado, um, in that case, I would really, really darken the sky, probably to a mid-dark. and uh, But that's not the way it would look in a photograph. So basically, the under part of these clouds is almost the same as the sky, just a little bit bluer. And so what we have here is a movement, right? That's what we want. Just create movement in your skies. I used some ultramarine up here so I can get the cooler color because uh, Prussian blue is warmer. So here I use ultramarine blue and then I started to use Prussian blue 
uh, at the bottom part. Okay, so we can go back now. See, we're almost there. Already it's operation success. That's because of that brushwork. So you can play this video over and over. I would recommend, you don't have to do the whole painting, but try to do the sky. And you know, keep the discipline of, the best way to learn something is by imitating, right? We do it with tennis, we do it with, with all kinds of things. And uh, try, to, try to keep your brush on that canvas like a, like a magnet. Don't lift it up so much and start playing it safe by scratching it. Just move that brush assertively and it'll give you big dividends at the end. <laughs> Just don't do a tornado's of plein air. <laughs> All right. Okay, so we're going to do... Some of the fluffy parts are going to pick up some of the yellow ochre because it's going to reflect on the ground. So we're going to intertwine it in here somewhere like this. Here's another thing that's not really pertinent today for today, but I'll mention it anyway, because I say what, you know, we advertise is what you need to know about clouds. The rule of thumb is that the smaller the segment of the sky that you dedicate in your painting, the, um, the more simplified the sky should be, it can even become a rest area. The more space you dedicate to your painting in the sky, then you need to add texture to it. In other words, clouds and special effects. Otherwise, you're going to get too many square inches of repeated information. Okay, I'm going to fine-tune this just a little bit. Wow, I'm liking it. So remember, the most important thing is to create that eye flow. That's, it's not about, see the secret, my friends, is in painting, it's not about representing something. We're going to talk about that day after tomorrow. It's not about representing what you see. It's not about being skilled to copy what you see. It's about reinterpreting and, and creating musical lines in your artwork. So I'm not going to negative paint in here. I don't think I should touch that cloud anymore. It's very expressive. You can see the expressive brush strokes there. So if it Joe, ain't... Joe, Olga said something to you in Spanish and... Pintar un huracán es difícil, todo va para un solo lado. Sí, cierto. She says it's not difficult to paint a hurricane. Everything points to one direction. Yeah, so yeah, what's cool about that, old guy, is that you can paint um, palm trees that are all leaning. Puedes pintar unas palmeras que están inclinando hacia un lado y es muy expresivo. And I'm just adding a little bit of more expression to this, but keep it simple. Keep big, big, broad brush strokes. Sometimes these uh, sort of straightish lines are pretty good because as um, the moisture accumulates at the bottom, it gains weight. And so it forms somewhat of a straightish line and it gives the impression it's going to rain. Now, we're missing something in these clouds. Who can tell me what it is? Gail is asking your brush looks nice and thin. Did you just trim it? Oh, you, no, this, this was relatively a new brush, but now that you brought up trimming, that's a good thing because sometimes these brushes splay no matter how much they cost because I beat them around quite a bit, right? Looks like I'm mixing pancake dough. Um, but the bristles start to splay, so I take a, a beard trimmer and I go over it and I can get rid of those little hairs that are sticking out and I got myself a new brush again. Ha ha ha. 
tricky. So Lucinda is saying darker values. Is that what is missing? Oh, yes, you are correct. But for what purpose? What, what, what do I call that when we add something to make it darker? Katarina said hard edges. Christine said reflected color. That's true. That's true. Okay, what we want to do is we want a 3D air cloud, right? 3D, 3D the cloud. And so the way we do that is we darken the very bottom. That's when you know it's going to start to rain. So right in here, actually it looks like it's going to hail. Look, it's menacing. Drama. By the way, talking about drama in skies, this next Saturday after this one, I have um, a course coming up, a workshop, called Secrets to Painting Majestic Skies. You should see those reference photos. Talking about drama. I'll show them to you uh, in a while. So we have two courses coming up. One that starts day after tomorrow and one that starts from this Saturday to next. Uh, the one that day after tomorrow is intensive. Five hours in a row, nonstop, except for a break. And the other one is three Saturdays, five hours each. See, now we got the th we 3D it. We 3D'd it. I'll put that in quotation marks so it doesn't look, sound like an English error. Okay, we, we're still missing something in here. What is it, folks? My students will know the answer. They always know the answer. Finger makes the best brush. Talking about brushes, by the way. What medium for majestic skies? That's all three mediums for the majestic skies. Yep. Oils, Oils pastels, and watercolors. Mm -hmm. Okay, no one's answered your question. Would you like my answer? <laughs> yep, because you know it. I know it. You're missing um, the color from the ground in your top clouds. That's right. Very rarely do you see that in real life. Um, I, I think I've just seen like once I saw a hint. But you see, we got to cheat. In other words, we have to contradict. We don't paint what we see with the naked eye. We paint what we see according to the way the eye sees, but we paint what we know. We paint what we know that we're supposed to see. <laughs> okay, so we have this ground here which has a lot of ochres. That's going to get the sunlight. That's going to bounce at the bottom of the clouds. You can feel right now that even though my sky has very nice movement, but it doesn't have, um, it's, no, it's not correlating with the bottom. So I'm going to take some, some orange and some yellow. It actually should be just yellow ochre and white. Even if it gets a little bit green, that's okay because we have green on the ground anyway. And we're going to bounce this. And then suddenly the sky and the ground are going to tie in together and harmonize. You got to do it where it's subtle. It's got to be like, uh, by the way, I see it, not make it so obvious. Right now it's a little bit too obvious, but I'll deal with it. it should, and it should be at the very bottom part of your cloud. That's a nice one right there. 
when you do reflected light, it should be in the sense that somebody comes in, you say, what do you see at the bottom of the clouds? They probably say, I don't, see, I don't just see the clouds. Do you see like a yellow tinge? And if they say, well, now that you're telling me, yeah, I can see it now. That's when you know that you're reflecting the light correctly. Now that you're telling me, I can see it. You know it's there. The viewer is supposed to perceive it's there, but not really identify it so easily, unless the, the viewer has in, um, knowledge of painting. See, right away, as soon as I add that yellow to it, do you see how it communicates with the bottom? We got a two-way conversation. I can do a little bit more over here. As long as they don't stack. As long as they don't stack. I invented that term, by the way. Rachel says, I can't believe you use such a large brush from start to finish. Yeah, that's the idea. Otherwise, you're going to go like this and you're going to start scraping it. Okay, I think we're or, good. There. Or else you'll get too detailed then. Yeah, and then, then you, want, you want to show those expressive brush strokes, right? The assertive brush strokes. It's better to risk working very assertively and expressive with your brush strokes. And if you make a mistake and to scrape it off and use a, like a kitchen wipe, like a Lysol wipe or a Kirkland Costco wipe, which works the best, by the way, the latter, then to play it safe and try to get on the first shot. There's nothing wrong with scraping off paint and starting over again in an area. Gail's asking, do you add the reflected light only to the middle, not lower clouds? I am adding, adding um, well, th theoretically, they would all reflect, but you would see them more on top of your head because you're looking under like an umbrella, right? So you're going to have more emphasis, but I don't want to make it look like it's neglected. So um, we're just going to put a few touches here and there. Also, when you add some yellow to the clouds, it actually look like it looks like it's going to rain. If you look at a sky carefully, that you can see with your naked eye. The yellow, like a yellow tinge, yellow uh, gray tinge in the clouds, that's not so much reflected light, but it gives you the idea it's going to rain soon. Debbie is asking if you could explain stacking. Well, Cindy's going to put the definition in a minute. Watch her text. Yeah, if you, she already has at, under Pearl Stark did add the definition of stacking. Okay, what it means is when you have one color value, basically it would be the both together color value in one plane, and you take that and you export it to another plane, then it seems like it, it doesn't recede. It seems like it hovers on the top. Um, so we that's that's what I refer to as stacking. Okay, I think we're done with the sky here. It's just, you know, it's demonstration, so. We got ourselves a little painting at the end. Well, you know what, Just let me just soften these edges because the rule of thumb is soften all your edges in your background with one exception, Rocky Mountains, because they lose their character. So these are like hills, and so yes, I will soften. Just so it doesn't look like it's cut out and pasted on from another photograph. I mean, my 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 reference photo is a Frankenstein, which means it's a compilation of several photographs. But you don't want your painting to look like it's a compilation of several photographs, and that would give the impression when you have too many hard edges that you did that. Same here with these trees. Just tap it on, and then we I think we have ourselves a, a painting, don't we? A little bit too overstated here. Okay. Oh, by the way, look at the gradient plane here. Darker, lighter. I like it. I'm happy with this painting, actually. It's a keeper. And I worked out the thumbnail sketch because as you're going to learn day after tomorrow... It's all about separating the masses, the sky, 
from the vertical mass and the horizontal mass. So I decided to make this into a skyscape. And um, so I worked it out where the predominant mass is going to be the sky. So your eye tends to wander more around here than it does down here. This is like a supporting actor, but your whole stage is over here. Yep, we're good on that. Okay, shall we do the watercolor? But I'm just doing a little commercial break for you, okay? Before we do the watercolor. I have here about our next course. Okay, so join us this Saturday for a five-hour intensive crash course on landscape composition. Uh, for those who took classes with me before, we've done composition before, but what we haven't done is to emphasize the thumbnail sketch design factor. We more or less skipped that. I mentioned it, but we didn't actually do exercises and demonstrations because I was always relying on the computer for the cropping and the masses. So this is, don't, don't think for a moment that you already saw this. Uh, there will be some things that I mentioned that you've already seen, but it's going to be more on thumbnail sketches, so that's going to be new for you. Not everybody has a computer, especially if you go out and plan air paint. You're not going to take your computer with you, right? So you need to do this in thumbnail sketches, so that's what it's going to be about. Um, okay, so this Saturday, August 3rd, secret... Uh, no, this Saturday coming up, it's an intensive crash course on landscape composition. That's only 11 dollars then the following Saturday, August 3rd, Secrets to Painting Majestic Skies. That's $19.99 for three Saturdays. That's over 18 hours. Wait, five, one to six. No, that's 15 hours. I need to correct that. Well, you know what, guys? It does go to 15, it does go to 18 hours anyway, doesn't it? Yes, what? it does. <laughs> <laughs> when have I ended a class on time anyway? I know Never. I always go past one or one one hour and ninety minutes more. Anyway, for information about this, um, artistnetwork.com paint along. Very easy to remember. Click there and you'll see that there's uh, the two courses coming up. And check out the photographs. I should show them to you right now. And then uh, join my Facebook page so we can be in touch. Um, I'm I'm t I'm posting uh, tips there. So far, I put thirty five tips. For example, a tip would be um, in order to create better forms of your clouds, when you negative paint, uh, you will you end up with random shapes rather than working on the positive shape where you're going to end up with circular motions. That's a tip, right? There's 35 of them in there. So we'll just approve you. Ooh, Facebook is not spelled correctly. Sorry about that. And your, and your Facebook page is really called live online art workshops with Johannes Bluthaus. Yeah. Would you like to see the pho the photographs that are, that are for the majestic skies? Let me show you. Know, before you do that, I think you should talk about how they're asking what day is watercolor, what day is oil. Really talk about how all three paint along classes are for all mediums. They're for all, everything that you learn is for all mediums. You can't get away with uh, good shapes. You can't get away with this principle of the cloudy skies that I'm telling you. What, that doesn't matter what medium it is. You still have to know about the different color temperatures. Now, uh, Cindy's taking notes. I sort of like rushed the, uh, the principles, the anatomy of the warm and the cool. She's going to put uh, a screen capture and she will put... Um, a caption so you're going to get a little you're going to get a little booklet with that information okay now Karen let me was asking when you're doing uh in plein air painting how do you keep up with the changing and moving skies well you the, the what you normally do is you paint what's going to move first 
if you if you're gonna paint a sky then the smart thing is to paint that first uh, that's called chasing the light by the way here I'll give a little bit more information about this give me one minute I'm gonna put this up for you to see I want you to, I want you to check out these reference photos you're gonna fall in love with them you're gonna want to sign up for that course that's only 1999 by the way Okay, check I'm this. not sure who said August 3rd, but the first paint-along course starts August 7th. August 7th. So, August August 7th. 7th. Yeah, okay, so look, there's the oil painting. Look how cool that is. Talking about drum, drama. So that's going to be August 7th. No, it's August, then August 14th. Look at that one. That's watercolor. This is going to be oils. This is going to be, I'm going to put a block in with acrylics, by the way. Um, so we don't muck up the oils as much. We get that clean color on top. So there's going to be some acrylic first and then oil on top. Then the watercolor. And then look at the pastel. Don't you feel like painting those guys? All right, let's get back on track here. Now we got the watercolor demo coming up. Okay, so I'll get rid of this palette. Let me put this one in its place. Normally I put the names of the pigments because it, I don't do two different uh, paintings, two different mediums in one class. Now comes a surprise. The seascape is already painted. That way I can finish on time. All right, I'm going to use the same approach. I'm going to wet the entire surface first. <sighs> Got a mosquito there on my... See the little mosquito that flew by? What you can do is you can, it's, it was already dead, I should have left it because I can just um, use some glue, put on there, put some wings on it and call the painting an organic painting. Can you change your reference photo, please? Yeah, thank you for reminding me. Oh, by the way, talking about reference photo, this is the photo for the composition course. And it's, um, just a minute. Yeah, so you is can... Is this course on Saturday watercolor? This is going to be oils next Saturday. That's the painting, but there's going to be some, there's going to be a power presentation, PowerPoint presentation and demonstrations on thumbnail sketches. Okay, but that's the subject that will be painted eventually. Isn't that nice? I can't wait to jump into that one. That's not a Frankenstein, by the way. Oh, I only added the lights. That's... Uh, that's the photograph it's at its raw presentation. Okay. Oh, you 
want me to change the reference photo? Where is it now? That's it. That is a Frankenstein. I put the sky in, I put the seascape on top of that. Okay, watercolorists. When it comes to watercolor, you definitely need step-by-steps. So I'm gonna wet the entire painting first. No, the sky, not the entire painting. Oh, I've done a lot of, uh, Karen, Karen Lee is asking me if I've done clouds outside. Um, I've done a lot of uh, plein air painting. Now I'm going to, well, I should, you know what, let me dry that because the, the lines are a little bit too harsh. It's going to show up on your camera more. So let me, hold on. Let me. Yes, yes Joe, I, I realized that her main question though was, how do you stop the clouds so you can paint them? Oh, what okay. Do you do? Oh, we, we, were gonna we were going to talk about that. Hold on, let me just dry this so I can erase the line. You're talking about a hurricane. You wanna do you wanna hear one? That's a special effect. I blow the water the uh, air right into the microphone. <laughs> I hope a lot of you didn't have dogs barking because of that. I'm just kidding around. I'm having a good time here, so it's a relaxation joking. Sorry about the bang noise. That also is to, it is to uh, keep you guys on your toes. Sorry. No, that wasn't on purpose. Okay. So let's wet that. Um, what you do, Karen Lee, is you paint what you know is going to move, such as a shadow. For example, if it casts shadow, you like it. Um, you can paint that first if it's oils. And then paint the sky first. Nowadays, of course, you can do this. You can take an iPad, right? Take a photograph of it and keep that for reference. So when it moves, you just look at your iPad. I mean, we got technology now that we didn't used to have. Arnold wants to know if those are Canadian palm trees. No, we don't have Canadian palm trees. We, I wish we did. We would be as populated as Florida. Canada would be a really good, would have a much larger population if it had the tropics. British Columbia, however, doesn't get that cold. It tends not to go that much over the freezing temperature because of the Pacific Ocean keeps it warm. But the setback is it rains all the time. Everybody's got green grass. Okay, take into account that you can never over wet your watercolor paper, but you can under wet it. So the only thing is that when you wet it a lot, you're just gonna have to wait longer. That's all, if you're gonna do a wet and wet effect. Now I'm using a contraption. You can see that nothing has buckled. By now, any other source, either stapling it down or taping it down, or the water cutter blocks, this would have already buckled. There's no buckling whatsoever. And that's because I have a really dandy contraption called Gorilla Watercolor Board, and it stretches the paper like a drum. It pushes into grooves, you tighten it, and there's no, no way on earth it can buckle. I can't live without it anymore. They have three sizes, the full sheet, half sheet, and quarter sheet. Okay, so I'm gonna use my three quarter inch 
scepter gold. And we're going to do the same principle. The white part of the clouds are, are warmer, sorry, cooler at the zenith, warmer at the bottom. So I'm going to use raw sienna for that. And I guess I'll start from the, i add more as I go. So we just have to just barely tint it. Now I purposely downplayed that wave. You can see that the wave is um, is darker. And I fought with that for a while and I worked that, I did work that out with a thumbnail sketch as well. The problem I had is that that would start to stack. Oh, I didn't, I didn't erase that one. It would start to stack. Which means that um, unless I can connect it with another cloud, it would it would compete with the light up here. So I decided to, because it's a sky scene, I want you to gaze at this area here. I want to pack the light like the sun's behind the clouds and downplay the wave, which is not usual that people do that. Usually the wave becomes a star, but because it's a cloudscape, um, I'm going to violate that rule. Well, that common way of doing it. Is this a 12 by 16? Uh, yeah, this is 12 by 16. That's normally the size that I paint my uh, demonstrations. I don't like the small, some people like 8 by 10s. I feel very constricted when I paint on that size. So I'm not crazy about that size. I like to push that brush around. Same with the thumbnail sketches. Uh, some, of, some people recommend that they should only be like a few inches, like maybe two by three inches. I also feel very constricted. So I prefer to um, to use a thumbnail sketch about the size of a poker card. That crashing wave. Now, what kind of line, I'm gonna show off my regular students. What kind of line do I have? What, what happened here? Did I get some oil paint on there? Oh, I did. There was a little bit of oil paint on the eraser, it seems. Oh, wait. I'm going to cover my mineral spirits. Imagine dipping my brush in there. That would be the end of it. We would all have to go home. Now, here's the thing, Karen. I'm going to address you about the plein air. I can see that you're a dedicated artist. There is really no need. In fact, you shouldn't be literal of what you see outside. Plein air should be more, more like an inspiration. Um, you, you should come to a point where you create your own forms, your own evergreen trees. Um, We'll talk about, if, if you register for the, my next course, I can I can elaborate more on that because I got five hours. Um, but the idea of a plein air is, is to feel the, the tremendous motivation because you're at the scene, right? Okay, I'm going to have to let that sink in a little bit. I don't know how this happened. Maybe I used some gouache. Well, I can fix that with pan pastels anyway. I'm not worried about it. Yeah, so it, it's it's going to be difficult to be literal with clouds anyway. I don't really copy things. I I just use it as inspiration, and then I do my own my own forms. I I don't really. Uh, I for example, I never copy an evergreen tree at face value. Because they're two, they're zigzag lines, which in my book are forbidden. And talking about book, yes, in my book, I actually do have a book published in Amazon.com or Barnes and Noble. It's a hardcover book called Landscape Painting Essentials. There are some tips, I think, of plein air there. Okay, we're going to do the same thing. Prussian blue. Okay, now I'm going to do this little trick. I'm going to spot dry some of these areas because I want a few hard edges here and there. So I get the most the most beautiful line that I can produce is the lost and found line. Okay, 
here we go. So the idea is to hold your brush flat. Got to put my own reference photo up. Okay, I'm gonna put my brush on the on the paper like that, and just pick it up without tilting it. And just tap. Hope I get some of those hard edges that I wanted. Come on, hard edges. I'm expecting you to show up. And they paint themselves. There you go. That's pretty easy, isn't it? Just tap and tap, tap, tap. Shall we tell about the mothership and the UFOs, Jude, or is that a little bit too silly? <laughs> it's your show. <laughs> is your is your palette a Masterson? Yeah, uh, no, this is watercolor palette. This is uh, ceramic. Okay. So we don't. So you guys remember this. Did you ever see the movie Independence Day about the mothership and a lot of UFOs were coming out of the mothership, mothership invading the states? And then even, even Mr. President went up in a jet to fight him. You remember that? Yes. Okay. Oh, so you saw it. Okay. Well, what you want to do is create little offsprings that come off the cloud. So this is the mothership and that's a UFO that's coming off it. Another analogy is just imagine they're Greek islands. That's probably a more formal one, but not, yeah, you won't remember like it as one. You won't remember. But the other one makes us smile <laughs> and giggle. So your palette, someone was asking about your palette, dear. This is just ceramic palette. You can buy them. It's a 12 by 16 inch ceramic pot paddle. Yeah, pa sorry. When I'm painting, I, my, my go top into my right brain and I start to stutter and sometimes um, use the wrong words. Um, this is a ceramic pa palette. And... Um, it's not good for going to workshops because it's heavy to carry. We'll excuse you as long as you paint abstract shapes with what you're doing. Right. <laughs> and you are so far. Well, you get that randomly when you're just dragging your brush around like I am. I'm not holding it like a pen. There's no way. Again, I don't have that stored muscle memory of how to do this as a kid. So I have well, no other option but to, but to uh, produce these forms. What we should say is you are doing the negative painting. You are doing the sky part around the clouds. Correct. And I'm not really respecting what I'm seeing in the photograph anyway. It's too overwhelming. I'm just feeling, see, there's a point here, even when it comes to plein air, you want to feel the place and then convey that feeling of the place, not necessarily the look of the place. See, it's already painting itself. That's a no brainer. This is so easy. Here, let's do another offspring here. See, I'm not even, I'm not, I'm just using the photograph for ideas, not really to copy it. And now another thing is you can see I'm pushing against the bristles, contradicting the bristles. That also gives you random forms. You do that with trees as well, which I've demonstrated many times. Okay, now we're going to shift to the more of a, like a warmer, Add a little bit of um, 
actually let's use this one a little bit of uh, green to that like we did in the oil painting so your first blue here was prussian blue it's right out of the tube Now, who can spot one of my secrets at the top of the cloud? Who can narrate that? How can you go wrong with this kind of brush stroke? Just paint against the bristles and you have all these little happy accents. You should see, try your trees that way. They're incredible. There's a technique there with the top, of, the top part of my clouds. I'll give you a little hint. It's got to do with eye movement. Uh, Tessa is saying lost and found edges. Well, well, I would have wanted more there, but I got some of them over here. But there's more. There's something about the sky at the top. Uh, what, Barbara what? said you created a pathway for the sky. That's right. The Panama Canal. Okay, so you go, the ship goes through here, moves this way, just like when you read. And goes to the bottom and it and you can see it subtly I'm making it go to where the wave is which is the focal point it's, a, it's subconscious only you the artist knows that I'm gonna have to use pan pastels to fix this little problem here I think I got some oil on my eraser that happens when you mix those two together Ah, uh, Mike got it. Graceful line. Yeah, clouds will always have graceful lines. Bingo. Which we'll talk about that also. It's the essence of everything. The, the graceful line, melodic line, is the answer to so many landscape problems. Okay, so we got that now. We're going to use Payne's Gray for the... Um, the shadow part of the clouds. In fact, you can just use uh, Payne's Gray right out of the tube if you want. Komako is asking, you are right-handed and going into your right brain. Do you have a routine to get there? Well, what's going to happen, that's a good question, by the way. This is based on uh, Betty Edwards' Um, theory about painting with uh, drawing from the right side of the brain and um, she she revolutionized the drawing because of that and uh, what happens is that in drawing you have to negative paint you have to put the dark into the light just like with watercolor that happens automatically the very fact that you contradict uh, working with the positive shape you become sort of say right brained automatically so it's effortless but what you want to do to double your artistic intelligence is you uh, you mix up positive painting and negative painting at the same time. I'm going to get a little bit of yellow. Just a tad of yellow ochre here, not much. Or Rossian, actually. I'm going to add a little bit of purple. Karen is saying, it looks like watercolor clouds are easier than pastel clouds. I'm saying, Karen, not really. Joe just makes it look easy. The trick with pastels is paint with the pastels on their belly. Don't paint with their tips. Only to make straight lines. That's the only time you want to do that. And 
adding a little bit of also some yellow to harmonize, even though we don't have that much yellow on the ground, but we're anticipating it would be a beach or something. Besides the watercolor, you can sort of get away with more color vibrancy. Okay, I'm going to take the distractions away from the corners. That's what I call the periphery of your painting. Again, can't go into detail now, but if you sign up for the courses, you'll learn about that. It's a very important concept as well. So keep the distractions away from the edges. Oh my gosh, I'm going to finish this. Go ahead. I'm going to finish this in no time. Did you use any burnt sienna in the top part of the sky? No, it, that's just the raw sienna that I put in the very beginning. Okay. Oh, well, note this. Rachel's asking if you want the top of the sky to be cool. Well, maybe you added a, a touch of burnt sienna to the dark part of the top clouds. Yeah, I'm adding, I'm, for harmony purposes, I'm adding some warm color there, correct. Now I'm going to get a little bit more blue in the middle ground of my sky. Did you note the circular motions that I did. Well, one thing for sure, we don't have to be chasing clouds if we do them in watercolor. Get it done in 10, 15 minutes. Yeah, I've done a lot of uh, plein air painting. I have an RV, and I've gone to public uh, national parks months in, at a time, uh, just living in my RV and painting. Okay, now we're getting to the bottom here and we're going to use, I'm going to use Cerulean Blue. Again, keep the distractions away from here. Raw, just right out of the tube. There's no, and I didn't add anything to it. Away we go. Make a little bit darker at the top now. Boy, that was fast. Still wet in one shot, Debbie. Normally I don't do it in one shot. See, so look at the way I'm just turning that brush around in circles. Darken the corners is a good way to keep the viewers in the painting. Purposely darker, even at the bottom, like if you got a, like a prairie or something, if you darken the immediate corner, making it look like it's going a little bit downhill, that looks good. Don't get dark clouds at the bottom. Those, those tend to be quite light. As far as the middle ground, you can go dark, but don't go dark in the, in the background, which I call this the background of your sky. Now, I can improve some areas by using sandpaper. Or I'm going to show you a drum roll tool. I can, I can get some glow in there, or, or I can just leave it the way it is. Well, you can use course. Barbara is asking, do you feel that your two corners at the top are too similar? Well, they, they are. They are. Do as I say, not as I do. I can add blue there. 
but it's okay. We'll let it go. Yeah. Remember, a painting is a reduction of errors, not the elimination of errors. If you think about eliminating errors, you're going to be too tight and you're not going to be loose. You don't need to be excellent to have a nice painting. You just need to uh, create an interesting mood. In other words, when the viewer starts to feel the place rather than to see the place, and the viewer starts to daydream with his or her own ideas, that's when you know you're, you're successful. See, by putting the glow in the sky now, I downplayed the wave. Now, I don't know what happened here. Let me see if I can paint over it with... Get some cerulean in there. It'll probably make it worse, but we'll give it a try. Yeah, I'll have to use pen pastels for that. I knew it. Let's put the palm trees in. Okay, Cheryl, both both courses are for sale right now to sign up. You go to artistnetwork.com artistnetwork.com you can see where it says paint along there's a painting of a forest there uh, with my name on it Johannes Flodos click on that and that's going to take you to uh, the, the two options that you can sign up for so the, the day after tomorrow it's uh, $11.99 it's one day and the following Saturday after that it's um Fourteen ninety nine. Okay, let's put the palm trees in. Yeah, also Artist Network is posting the link so you can click right on it. Now some of you might be wondering, that's so that's a very low price. How eleven ninety nine for five hours and then nineteen ninety nine for 15 hours, three Saturdays. How can you do it for that price? Well, Artist Network is is a, is the, the largest, I would say, as far as I know, is the largest um, educational uh, company for, for fine arts. They started with uh, Northlight Books and the magazines. So they've been in business for a long time. And they have we have a lot of people. We have hundreds and hundreds of students registered. That's why we can do it for that price. And they ha we haven't raised that in 10 years now. Okay, so let's put the palm trees in. I, as you can see, I wet the sky first. In my opinion, when there is doubt, if you should go wet on wet or not, I always give the benefit of the doubt to the latter. Go wet on wet. You're all, it's always a good policy to do that. Okay, it's a little bit too... Now, I'm going to venture on the following. Um, remember, you're going to get notes. This is going to be documented by Cindy, and you're, and you're going to, it's going to be a PDF booklet. But we're going to offer one more thing. How about we offer you the recording of today's session for you to download? Oh, but you get on YouTube anyway, right? Yeah, so probably not much of a benefit there. You wet everything around the palm trees? I wet the whole you know, the whole area. Wow. Uh, what color, how are you mixing your greens? Um, I use Prussian blue and then the, the, the siennas and the and the ochres or the raw, yeah, the siennas, bird sienna, uh, et cetera, a little bit of blue. So cerulean blue, Prussian blue, and uh, burnt sienna, raw sienna.
Yeah, I was going to say the recording, but you get it anyway. It just stays on YouTube. I was thinking in the other terms. I do a few brush strokes and then I shift colors. Joe, if some people paid uh, fourteen ninety nine, they're going to get uh, a refund. Okay. Just have to you have to send an email to head office at customer. No, sorry, support at artistnetwork.com. Put their paint along in the subject, and then the body of the message just say um, that you want your three dollar refund. Already some people have gotten it. Sorry I interrupted you, Jude, but I know exactly where you were going. Nope, that's good. Okay, when you start to clone them, the answer is join them. Just like you do with rocks, whatever's cloned gets joined. So if I put them in one great big unit like this, then they don't look cloned anymore. And that's the only standalone. It's a little bit of a trick to do that. Uh, i probably grab some hookers green out of just to do it faster, Mike, but you don't need it. I just, because I'm time sensitive now, right? I don't want to prolong the, the demo that long. So I just rush it and just grab it. But normally you don't even need the, the, the pre-mixed greens. I used to live, um, the lady from Mexico City, yo viví en Manzanillo cuatro años. So I know what palm trees look tr Palm trees look like. I lived in a beach resort in Mexico for four years when I was a teenager. Manzanillo, some of you probably know Manzanillo. Palm trees everywhere. So I got them pretty well identified. That's a little bit too fat. See if I can fix that quickly before it's too late. Make it skinny. There it is, I was able to get to it. That's right, in fact, in the movie 10, um, my wife, Funny you bring that up. She wasn't. We lived in. She she um, she was my girlfriend then, and uh, she was an extra on the movie. And she made friends. They be, she became good friends with the the mother of uh, the children of E.T. the movie. I don't remember her name. She was in that movie with Dudley Moore. And uh, she was paid to do some acting there as an extra. And the, the hotel Las Jadas. See, I let all those palm trees bleed. There is no reason to have any hard edges there. Put yourself in the painting star. Oh, thank you, Shirley. That's very nice. You know, watercolor skies really do paint themselves. I'm going to use a magic contraption. In fact, it was better that this went a little bit haywire on me because I'm going to show you a medium 
that's extremely compatible to fix any watercolor. It's called Pan Pastel. They're so compatible. A match made in heaven. So you're not even going to see that little mishap there. So we use applicators like this. This is the tray. You can correct almost anything with a watercolor this way. Carol is asking, the palm trees have a unique texture. Do you need to repeat that subtly elsewhere? Well, I have no other way to justify where to put it, do I? I mean, that's where am I going to put it? But I don't think you have to worry about repeating texture. More, more it's about color where you want to echo. See you guys, goodbye, good riddance. That's the end of that ugly little thing that went on there. And then we can put a little bit of blue there. Just keep adjusting it. Isn't that cool? Now, I'm going to bring out another little contraption here. No, I used I live in Canada now. But I or my but I used to live in Mexico City. See, I can do this with the clouds. Or the waterfall. Pick up, pick up some of the sunlight. I can do the same over here, but I'm not going to overdo it. So that's pretty. Impressive, isn't it? <laughs> okay, we're going to put 
just a little fix this little dots there I don't know how those got in there either and we're done I can I can darken the clouds with pan pastels too I can do anything I want with them and you won't even tell you know that you can't even tell that I put pan pastel on top of a watercolor What can I say? Oh, I need to negative paint those ever uh, those uh, what do you call them? The, um, palm trees. They need a little bit more of a three Ding. So we're gonna. I know that's not a verb, but I made it up. Three Ding. You're going to 3D your palm trees? Yeah. Yep. Yes, so. Just a bit. You're getting many beautiful paintings, and thank you for the great demo. And I made it in, um, in an hour and a half. That's because I already pre-painted this. Hour and a half for two paintings. Well, partial paintings. Yeah, that's incredible. This is called negative painting too. You have no other option but to do it like this in watercolor. Three D my grass. Even that should be three D'd. So the fluffy part is um, cooler here, warmer here. The rainy part, the shadow part of cloud is warmer, darker here. Not always. It all depends. You know, these are not really rain clouds today, so I didn't really bother, but you, you can make these darker than this, but this is warmer and cooler, so I added a little bit of purple there. This has less of it. It's not, it doesn't show up very well on your, on your um, video, but here it's, you can see the orange color here. And then these are important, these little fluffy areas there. What I like about watercolor, they don't get so easily with oils, is this, the reason why I pre-wet it is you can see that this spot is darker than that. So these are like background clouds. If you look at skies carefully, you get background the clouds are not really actually clouds. They're just variances in value in the sky. And then you get more intense blue sky around that, which is what you see here. And that makes it work. And that avoids the, like I said, the sheep swimming in a pool um, effect where you have, you know, stark blue sky and then white clouds. It looks too fake. So... This way, it doesn't look fake. And that's supposed to represent what you see here in the photograph. You can sort of see it in the photograph. You do see this in real life. You can see there's a little bit of a variance right in like in the middle, those little small clouds. You can see that parts of that sky are a little bit lighter. Those are just clouds that are starting to form. I could use a little bit more sandpaper here, but I think that for the demo, we got it. We got it, don't we? Um, okay, so. I'll put the next course inf information up. Do you have any questions? I can ask, I got a little bit more time. If you have any questions pertinent to anything, landscape painting, pet portraits, 
portraits, still lifes, you name it, um, I can cover it all. So if you have any questions, I'm, I, I want to boast a little bit. I'm, an, I'm a walking encyclopedia. Will do. Uh, you can uh, still life. I already did that course, Gail. If you go to improve my, uh, if you go to artistnetwork.com, type in essentials of painting still lifes. There's a whole course there with a really neat PowerPoint presentation of all the principles of still lifes. Um, and that course is downloadable. It's already there in three mediums: oils, watercolor, and pastels. Uh, birds. Uh, birds, birds. Okay, good question, Goat. About Goatisa, about birds. Um, yeah, why don't let's put a few in. I would say I would use a pencil for that because they're it's got that gray sort of feeling to it. As long as you keep them subtle, you can put them in. Now you can you can also make a theme with. Uh, with seagulls up coming, you know, close to you if you want to. And then, um, but this is what I would, well, wait, seagulls, you, I was going to say you should blur their, their wings, but you don't have to with seagulls because they hover. Other birds, you have to blur their wings so they feel like they're flapping. So if you just put them small here, put them in different positions. Sometimes just a dot. Don't make them too big because if they look too big, they look like jet f uh, fighters approaching you. The moment you make them too big, they look like they're from the, the, the Air Force. And group them together. Just like that will work. I use a pencil. Irma's asking how to get a more realistic effect. With watercolor, landscape, you don't paint realism with watercolor. Now, don't, I would say pursuing realism would probably work for very, very large paintings. But the trend is most successful artists, most top artists paint something that's called representational landscape painting, which conveys the idea of the place, the feeling of the place, without getting into the nitty gritty. Besides, it's it's gonna t take you months and months to do a, you know a, you know hyper realist painting. I'll eventually I'll do a pet portrait class. But uh, yeah, if you look at the most top artists, if you look at galleries like Legacy Gallery, Trailside Gallery, they're all representational landscape painting. Maybe the exception are one or two artists who are hyper realist, but it's that that's not in because um, on small paintings it looks weird because everything is hard edge, and then that's not the way the eye naturally sees reality. Okay, so uh, big, uh, people and port. There's a lot of materials on portraits. Also, an artist network there is. Um, the idea that the secret with uh, portraits, Komoko, is to handle the edges correctly. No, it, it's not, in other words, a portrait should never have a hard edge. Nowhere. They sh everything should be soft edge in the sense that, yes, it can be defined, but never there should be a crisp edge in a portrait because nothing is a 90-degree angle. Okay, so well, I think we're done with this. So I hope you can all sign up. Those who are um, already my students, you have probably gotten an email already with the next course information, or you're going to get it within the next 15 minutes that you can click on. Okay. Oh, let me put this next course up here. And there you go. 
So I'll see you next Saturday. How does that sound? One o'clock. You're welcome, Ruby. Nice seeing you again. Oh, yeah, I can add sun rays with Pan Pastels with this. Correct. Pan Pastels is the best way. Oh, there's another way that you can add the sun rays to this. You can use um, an ink eraser. It's very subtle. Or you can just use the Pan Pastels. Um, in, this, in this case, it won't work that well because I have a lot of these small clouds. But if I have more of a bluer... Well, I, here, let me show you guys. I did a painting just recently. You Here, I'll show you since that already came up. Paint along. Uh, okay, I'll show you the painting I did from last course. That was uh, a watercolor, by the way. And there are sun rays there that are done with pan pastels. I did that last class, last course. You, that's a, the same application. As long as you keep them subtle, it works. This is a special effect. Yeah, maybe I should so show. Yeah, so also if you go to improvemypaintings.com, that's my website. Click on gallery so you can see the kind of work that I do because you only saw two paintings today plus this one, but maybe you don't have an idea of, of what the kind of work I do. So improvemypaintings.com. Okay. Somebody can type that link in for me. I would appreciate it. I think with gallery, just type on, click on gallery. Okay, I'll let you go now. See you next Saturday, everybody. Thank you, Scott, for, ty for typing that in. Have a good uh, day, everybody. Keep, stay safe. Lots of painting. Goodbye for now.